going to read from Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah chapter 42, and the first four verses. Isaiah chapter 42, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delight. I have put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flag shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he had set judgment in the earth. The isles shall wait for his love. And in these words, our Saviour is set forth. He is the servant appointed by the Father. And the New Testament confirms that Jesus Christ is the one that is in view. He does not break the bruised reed. He does not quench the smoking blocks. He is the one who is all-powerful and yet the one of great gentleness. Lord's help as we come and worship our God in the meeting this evening. And may our attention be lifted to the great servant in whom the Father delights. We'll seek the Lord's face briefly in prayer. Our gracious Father, we give thee thanks to the Lord for the privilege to meet together for this season. And we pray that the help of God will be given. Oh Lord, we pray that our attention will be lifted to Christ, and uh, Lord, that our hearts will be fed. Uh, oh Lord, we pray that we will be enabled to uh, honor our great God in this gathering. And we pray that in the end, that all the honor and glory will be his grant help. We pray in our Lord's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn in our hymn books, please, to the paraphrase 23. And paraphrase 23 is based on those words that we were just reading together. And Jared would hope to be here uh, this afternoon, but there's been a, a, a late change, and Alan's gone to play in another meeting. Uh, so Harris is going to play some music through the computer, hopefully. Uh, so it's paraphrase 23, and we're singing to the end of verse 4, just over the page, and thank the following.
Seek the Lord's face together, please. Let us look to the Lord for his help in our time together. Our gracious Father, we give thee thanks for our great Savior. We thank thee for the one who rode triumphant into Jerusalem. And yet it was said that he was meek riding upon that donkey. O oh Lord, we thank thee for him who is the lowly one and yet is the victorious conquering one. O oh Lord, we thank thee for him who though we had sinned against him and his holy law, that he came to obey that law on our behalf. He came to meet, take the penalty for our breaking of that law. You can say then with the hymn writer, the wrath that was our due upon him was laid. Stand amazed think of the awful weight of our sin that Christ would bear it all thank thee that he has borne away the wrath of the Holy God this evening we are accepted as righteous in thy holy sight O oh Lord grant help we pray in our season together come near we ask we pray that we will by thy grace, hear the voice of the Lord again. O oh Lord, we pray that we will be built up through the living truth of God. Draw near to us, then we ask. O oh Lord, we pray that every hindrance of the devil will be swept away and in this season, that we will be very conscious of the Lord's speaking to us. Conform us to thy image, we pray as we thought this morning that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son and through the preached word this evening we pray that we will be more holy conformed to the image of Christ grant help then and we pray in our Lord's great name Amen. we're going to turn in our hymn books please to the psalm number 80 the psalm Number 80, and later will be coming to consider divine. And the latter part of this psalm it speaks of Israel as divine, pointing us to the Church of Christ today as divine, the Christ being divine, we are the branches. Psalm 80, singing from verse 14, O God of hosts, we thee beseech, return now unto thine. So, Psalm 80. Verse 14 and through to the end.
indeed turn upon us in these days, may the Lord look upon us in his great favor and see the Lord at work afresh in our time. We will turn please in our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 15. And then I also want to read from John 15. So Ezekiel 15 first of all and then John. First of all, Ezekiel 15. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree, or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall wood be taken thereof to do any work? Or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel thereon? Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it and the midst of it is burned. Is it meat for any work? Behold, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less when, how much less shall it be meat yet for any work when the fire hath devoured it and it is burned? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will set my face against them. They shall go out from one fire, and another fire shall devour them. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. When I set my face against them, and I will make the land desolate, because they have committed a trespass, saith the Lord God. Then we'll turn to John 15, please. John 15, reading from the verse 1. Our Saviour here in the upper room, ministering to his disciples. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, or severed from me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. Men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will should be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. We'll end there, knowing the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. We're going to have now the Catechism, and we've come to the question 101 in the larger catechism and so I will ask the question and together then we will bring the answer. What is the preface to the Ten Commandments? The preface to the Ten Commandments is contained in these words, I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage, wherein God manifests his sovereignty as being Jehovah, the eternal, immutable, and almighty God, having his being in and of himself, and giving being to all his words and works, and that he is a God in covenant, as with Israel of old. So with all his people, who he brought them out of their bondage in Egypt, so he delivers us from our spiritual problem, and that therefore we are bound to take him for our God alone and to keep all his commandments. 
And so uh, these words, as we take them and apply them to ancient Israel in the Old Testament, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And we see then this statement of God's sovereignty over Israel, that he had chosen them, he had preserved them in the bondage, and now he had brought them back out again. And so we see the great power of God, the almighty God. And then he was God in covenant with Israel. And so as he had covenanted with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so then God would keep covenant with the seed. And God then brought them out of bondage. He brought them into the wilderness that he might bring them into the promised land. And these words then were a teaching God's people in the Old Testament, his sovereignty over them. I have shown myself strong, and therefore, as I have delivered you out of Egypt, you are to submit to my sovereignty. And the Lord speaks with the authority, then I give you the commandments to obey. As he was God in covenant, again, they being the seed under, they were to see their obligation to God in covenant. And as the writers of the Catechism then teach, uh, that while we were not in literal Egypt in bondage, that it points to us that we have been delivered from the bondage of sin, from the, the grip, from the authority of Satan, and so we are delivered, uh, we are brought into Christ, and therefore we are bound to take God for our God, the great sovereign one, the, the God in covenant. And may the Lord enable us then today to be uh, people that take on board even these words of introduction, that the Lord has the divine right in his sovereignty to say, this you are to do. And as the Lord has taken us uh, into covenant union with himself, but again, we are to submit and to obey his holy commandments. May the Lord enable us so to do. Thank you all for coming this evening. It's good to see each one in the meeting and also those that are joining us online. We appreciate all that have joined and we trust that we will know the Lord's help as we come in a few moments to meditate upon this truth. We will sing together, please, the words of the hymn 737. 737. It's on the page 471. We don't often sing these hymns in the harvest section. Back in the United Kingdom and Ireland, generally churches have harvest thanksgiving services in the autumn, and they sing these hymns. Are Harvest here isn't so uh, defined, the harvest time uh, isn't so defined and yet. Uh, given our subject this evening, I thought it was good to sing these words, Come, ye thankful people, come, raise the song of harvest hope. 737, and we're going to remain seated at the beginning as the offering for God's word is received. <laughs>
We'll sing just one verse of 735 without music. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning bright and fair? 735, and we'll sing just the first verse and the chorus as we sing. Please will stand. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning bright and fair? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the noonday's glare? For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Sheaves be many, will you garner any for the gathering at the harvest home? You may be seated. We will turn again, please, in God's holy word to Ezekiel and the chapter 15. Ezekiel and the chapter 15. We'll read again the verses 4 and 5, please. Ezekiel 15, verses 4 and 5. Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it, and the midst of it is burned. Is it meat, or is it useful for any work? Behold, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. So when the, the branch was complete before it was cast into the fire, it wasn't useful for work. How much less shall it be meat or useful yet for any work when the fire hath devoured it and it is burned? We will seek the Lord's face together, please, in prayer. We need the Lord's help as we come look at this portion together as each pray. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for the living and abiding word of God. We thank thee that these words that were so vital for the captives all of those years ago are still for our good today ask then for the help of God to be given, that as we meditate upon thy truth, the help will be given from him, and that we will be built up through the living word. Grant help then that needed help, yet promised help of the Holy Spirit of God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. One of the Blessings I find in coming to live in a warmer climate is we have things here in this land that we read off in the Bible, and things that I didn't necessarily see growing up. And one example of that is the grape vine. And so I didn't see these in Northern Ireland. I certainly didn't own one. Some may have them there in the glass houses, but even that is not a regular sight. The vine that we are blessed in this land to be familiar with. It was a very frequent image in the Old Testament. We sang earlier from the Psalm 80, where Israel is spoken of as the vine. And that same image is used by the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Hosea. And as we read a short time ago, the Lord also used that image of the vine and the branches in John chapter 15, speaking of the reunion between Christ and his church. And it is significant that this one image that is used for Israel in the Old Testament is also used to describe the church of Christ in the New Testament. And there's a sense in which we should not be surprised by that. For 
we believe that it is one body. Old Testament Israel was the visible church of Christ on earth in that era. Today, as we speak of the church in the New Testament, certainly the fulfillment, the consummation of what is set forth in the Old Testament, but we're always to remember that the scripture is clear that it is one body. That is not to deny that there's a future for physical Jews, or those that have a physical descendancy from Abraham. And yet God's word is clear that there is one body, one people, and it is a people that are redeemed through the precious blood of Christ, therefore one hope. And as we come then to Ezekiel 15, recognizing that this theme of the vine is not unique to Ezekiel, we have to ask, what is the image of the vine? And taking scripture as a whole, both the New Testament and the Old Testament, we see clearly that the vine is a picture of the visible church. The, the vine is a picture of the visible witness of Christ on earth, if we put it that way. Now using that phrase, the visible church, we need to be clear in our minds what we are speaking of when we use that particular terminology. We speak of the invisible church or the universal, universal church. The invisible church is that great company of God's people. It's made up of only the converted. And it's a body that only the Lord truly knows those who are in it. And so it's the great company of the redeemed in heaven and in earth. And it's only the Lord that truly knows, without error, those that are in that body. There is then on earth what we call the visible church. A, a company of people that can be seen, therefore called invisible. And that body is made up of the converted and their children. But in their company are also some that are unconverted. Some that have a profession and believe that they are converted, and we may well also believe that they are converted, and yet the truth is that the Lord says, I never knew them. And so we make this distinction between the invisible and the visible church. And it is a biblical emphasis that the Lord knows. And while we are to use our discernment, the Lord's discernment is perfect. And this is something that's brought out in the New Testament parables, in that parable of the wise and foolish virgins. Now, the Lord there was not talking about those that profess the Lord's name against those that have no time for the things of God. Rather, all ten of those virgins are part of the professing church. But tragically, only five of them possess the oil. Only five of them had the Holy Ghost. Only five were truly converted. Or we have the parable of the good and bad fish caught in the net. Those who are truly the Lord's they are the good fish, but as the gospel net is cast, as the gospel is preached, there are bad fish that are caught as it were. They are in the company of the Lord's people, and yet tragically they are not truly redeemed. Or in the parable of the wheat and the tares, both grow together until the harvest. Among the company of the Lord's people, there are the tares, but they will in the end be uncovered and discovered. In Ezekiel chapter 15 then, as we see this vine, it is again in accordance with these various passages speaking of the visible church of Christ on earth. 
the visible witness of God on earth. And while in Jerusalem, there would be a company that would profess allegiance to God. The truth was that they were not true converts. And yes, outwardly, they had the mark of being in Israel. And yet there had not been a cutting through to the flesh. And so that is why in this passage as well as in John 15, we read of the cutting and burning of branches. And so if we take these passages to speak only of the universal church in that invisible sense, there'll be a great problem. How do we understand the branches being cut away? But seeing this distinction, we see clearly how this is the case. Now, in Ezekiel 15, the key to understanding this particular chapter is the word usefulness or meat as it's translated here in the authorised version. And towards the end of verse 4, is it meat for any work? Is it useful? And it said then to the prophet that a branch cut from the vine and cast into the fire is absolutely useful. It cannot perform a, a function. And so really the challenge of this passage is this. Is the visible church useful? Or is it useless? Is it performing the function that God has raised it for? Or rather, in all of his other occupations, as it missed the point of why the Lord has raised it up in the first place. And the Lord had raised up his people, the Lord had given Jerusalem that Israel would be a fruitful land, that they would bring glory to God. But if they failed to do that, then what was even the point in their existence? And so we have this thought arising out of the passage for us today. Are we living useful lives? Is the witness in this congregation useful or useless? I want to see first of all with you the singleness of purpose of the visible church. The singleness of purpose of the visible church. If you look with me at verse 2, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree? Or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall we be taken thereof to do any work, or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel thereon? And so, really, the question is being asked in ancient Israel How is a vine greater, superior than a great cedar, or a great poplar tree, or a fir tree? Or in our context here in Western Australia, how would you compare a vine to a, a great ghost gum tree or a jarrah tree? No one grows vines to make furniture. And so you've never had the experience when you've gone into someone's home and spoken about the furniture where they said to you that, that furniture was made from the vine. No one grows grapevine to make furniture. Nor would you grow it even to make a peg. It doesn't even have the strength to bear anything up. Verse 3, shall we be taking the rock to do any work or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel or all? So you don't grow a vine to be a soaring tree in the forest. And you don't plant a vine to make furniture or to be a peg. So why would you have it? It only has one purpose. And it's a great purpose. The sole purpose of the vine is to bring forth fruit. And therefore, 
this is why the Lord raises with Ezekiel this important issue of being meat or usefulness, suitable service, fit for service. The vine is one function to bring forth fruit. If a vine cannot bring forth fruit, then it is absolutely useless. And so in the context of the chapter then, if Israel cannot bring forth fruit before a holy God, then it's absolutely useless. How was Israel better than any other people? If there was no fruit brought before a holy God, how is Israel distinct from other nations if it does not bring forth fruit unto God? And now the ungodly, we could say they would focus upon the cedar or the gum tree. They want to make a great name for themselves. They want to be honored. And though the tree is soaring, it's earthbound living that's in view. But the Christian is different. The Lord has saved us. And in saving us, the Lord has kept us here on the earth with this one great purpose. And in a sense, we could say this one sole purpose. We are branches of a vine to bring forth fruit. And so, as we ask this question, is the visible church useful or useless? It is not defined by the number of adherents in a congregation. It is not defined by the fame or otherwise of the preacher. It is not defined by how well that people is received in a community. The usefulness of the visible church is defined in this alone. Are they bringing forth fruit? Are they bringing forth fruit? Isn't there a warning in this to Christian parents? You think of those questions there in verse 2. What is the vine tree more than any tree, or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? We want our children to do well. Perhaps even we have this thought, well, if my children do well, that reflects well in me. It's more important that our children are fruitful branches cedars in the forest. It might be nice if our, our children have a first degree from UWA or become a director of the BHP group. But in the end, that is useless. Useless. There's no fruit in the professing branch. Better to be in some lowly place living for God, but a branch that is bearing much fruit. And so we'll turn then to John 15. Uh, this is surely the emphasis of this chapter. The purpose of the branches of the vine is to bring forth fruit. And towards the end of the verse 2, it says, bring forth more fruit. And then in verse 5, bring forth much fruit. Uh, and so here is this great theme. What is the Lord desiring? Fruit. More fruit. Much fruit. The verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified. How does the church of Christ on earth today glorify God that ye bear much fruit? And we are to be as Joseph whose branches ran on over the wall, drawing from a supply of water, bringing forth much fruit. And what is the fruit? It is, of course, that fruit that Paul spoke of in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on. And so the fruit in the life of the Christian is not merely absence of certain behaviors 
Uh, and there is a danger, uh, even within evangelicalism, that we can fall into this trap of having a, a list of rules of what a Christian looks like. Uh, a Christian does this, but he doesn't do that. Uh, and certainly, I believe there are things that a Christian ought not to do. Uh, and yet, we can come up with our list. A Christian does this and he doesn't do that. But that is not how the Lord defines the fruit. The Lord is not merely interested in the externals. The Lord is looking into the heart. And therefore, the fruit it is external, but it arises from the heart. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, and so on. And therefore, the fruit has a Christ focus, a grace focus. And that's what's brought out in John chapter 15. How is there more fruit? It's not merely by having a box ticket exercise he is abide in the vine abide in the vine now if there's abiding in the vine there will be transformation to follow verse 4 of John 15 abide in me and I in you and it goes on to speak of how severed from me without me you can do nothing a branch that is not able to draw from the vine will not fruit then is found as we feed on Christ, as we draw from him. And so what is the burden then of the passage in Ezekiel chapter 15? It's really this. If you're not bearing fruit, your life is useless. If you're not bearing fruit, your life useless. You're wasting your life. And in that sense, it's a hard chapter to bear. It's confronting. But we have to take God's word. It's their fruit. The singleness of purpose for the visible church, we are to be bringing forth fruit. But then I want to see, secondly, the stubbornness of heart in the visible church. Perhaps this is more implied in the passage that is clearly stated. But if you look with me at verse 4, it says that uh, a branch without fruit is cast into the fire of the fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it and the midst of it is burned. Is it meat? Is it useful for any work? Behold, when it was whole, when it was green, it was meat for no work, how much less shall it be meet yet for any work when the fire hath devoured it and it is burned. Now keeping in mind the burning that is in view here is the coming destruction of Jerusalem. So remember in these chapters the destruction of Jerusalem has not yet taken place. But remember in the context of the book of Ezekiel Jerusalem has been well warned that the fire would come. And so remember, Ezekiel and those with him by the river Kebar in Babylon, they had been taken away into captivity. The Lord was disciplining, we could say, the vine. The Lord was showing the vine, there must be fruit. And if there's no fruit, the branches will be cut off, they will be taken and cast into the fire. And so before verses 4 and 5 were fulfilled in that sense of the destruction of Jerusalem, Jerusalem was well warned. But what do we see then? That they did not heed the warning. And the Lord had warned. And yet Jerusalem sat comfortable. I say then, by the visible church can be stubborn. 
And so then, as we take that and apply it to the Church of Christ in our day, the Lord can come and speak to his visible church. And the Lord, both through the scriptures and through providences, is surely saying to his church in our day, you must repent. You must get right before a holy God. You must put away your confidence in everything else but your confidence in the living word of God and in the Lord himself to move. Remember how the Lord was speaking to those seven churches in Asia Minor. He was saying to those churches, repent, or else I will come and take away the candlestick, the lampstand. The Lord disciplines, the Lord warns. But tragically, the visible church at times is stubborn. And we have to learn then that the vine owes its existence. The vine owes its existence to the Lord. The very fact that there was a temple in Jerusalem in the first place, it was because of the Lord's grace. The very fact that a people had been brought out of Egypt and brought into Canaan and planted there as a vine, it was the Lord. A vineyard does not come into existence accidentally. The scriptures make that clear vineyards planted and therefore we are to remember we owe our existence to the Lord the visible church of Christ in this land we owe our existence to the Lord in this congregation we owe our existence to the Lord and we'll be tied us if we're stubborn and we also have to learn that the vine is weak and that's why it's no use to take Clipping from the vine and used as a pay. It's a striking plant. It needs care. It's not self sufficient. And so, even going back to the planting, you don't just plant a vineyard in the bottom. Because it's weak. It's weak. And that brings us to another thought that the vine needs protection all the time. Remember those parables that the Lord taught in the Gospels concerning the vineyard? And there's a vineyard planted. There's a wall put round about it. And if you plant the gum trees, you're not going to need to put a wall around them. And they're quite strong enough to protect themselves. But you see, the vineyard is weak. The vine branches they need protection in the gospels in the parables it talks also about a, a, a tower so there was the digging applying the manure the planting there was a wall around and there was a tower they, there was continual vigilance needed over the branches of the vine all the time. And we can't survive in our own strength. We are weak. And as the Lord then comes at times and shows us our weakness, it ought to drive us afresh through the Lord for strength. May we heed the Lord's discipline that comes. Stubbornness of heart in the visible church. And I want to see that finally with you. The scrutiny of pretense in the visible church. The scrutiny of pretense in the visible church. In Jerusalem, as we've seen already in this book of Ezekiel, what were the religious leaders and the people saying? All is well. We are the Lord's appointed people. came a point when the Lord then said the branches would be cast into the fire. The devouring fire will come. And notice with me what it says in verse 7. I will set my face against them. They shall go out from one fire and another fire shall devour them. 
And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. I will make the land its roots. What a fearful image. Fire. And yet, so clearly, this is pointing us then to the destruction of the false professing among the Lord's people. John 15, verse 6 If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the sit in the company of God's people they have profession without possession no fruit and have been quite content that it is so the Lord says the branches will be cut off cast into the fire and the scrutiny then is this Day of judgment. Day of judgment. All will stand before God, including the professor. And for those that have pretended to be branches, and though they have brought forth no good fruit, their sin will be exposed, cast into the fire, destroyed forever. If we ended there, it would seem a message of despair, wouldn't it? But if we come to this passage, are we not directed to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ? For in the verses 4 and 5, the vine is cast into the fire, the branch is cast into the fire, and it's deserved. That's what they have merited. But are we not then directed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ came forward, he said, I am divine. And our Savior, and while he had brought forth an abundance of fruit, he came to be cast into the fire on our behalf. He came to take the wrath that was our due. That we might then be united to him. That on account of his death, on account of his finished work, on account of him having met the just demands of a holy God, on account of him being our propitiatory our propitiate sacrifice, we are united to the true vine. We bring forth. I'll close then with considering words in John 15 verse 2 every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and now an alternative translation of these words has been suggested that is the words taketh away where the word actually has the idea of lifting and in the translation here then it's really got the idea of lifted and taken away can be translated that way. But it has been suggested that perhaps what's in view there, he taketh away. And it's actually got the idea of lifting up. And for you know, if you've grown grapes, and that the branches on the ground, the fruit will be trampled upon. Or they're not going to get the light. So what does the husband man do? He lifts the branches, he lifts them up. Lifts them onto the support that they might bear more fruit. And then the branches that they need the pruning. They need those things that are a hindrance to be cut away again that they might bring more fruit. 
forth more fruit. And praise God. And the Lord lifts us then that his favor shines upon us. He purges us. He prunes us. Hateful though it is. But so that we live grateful. May the Lord, by his great grace, enable us through this year to be fruitful. And may we be those branches that are not useless. That are not good for only destruction alone. But may we rather have brought fruit. May the Lord bless his word to us in our hearts. We will close, please, by singing 397. In 397, uh, these words are drawn from John 15 concerning the abiding, abiding, oh so wondrous sweet, I'm resting at the Savior's feet. In 397, we will stand together, please, as we sing, and then remaining standing for a closing prayer.
led the dry fruit to the glory of God. Oh Lord, we pray, even for those that sit in our meetings from week to week who know not Christ. Oh Lord, we pray that thou will be pleased to open their blinded eyes. Lord, may they be brought to that saving faith in our Lord. And yea, we pray that even in this community round about us that we will see the precious souls being brought to thee and their lives demonstrating that they truly have met the that there will be that genuine fruit of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all.